A jury is now deciding whether Nathaniel Veltman murdered a Muslim family in the name of terror. I, it was me. It was me. It was me that did it. Now come arrest me. We review what was heard in court and also what wasn't, like these calculations for killing. This is an incredibly important moment. Muslim Canadians in particular now waiting for a verdict that could make history. And that verdict could come any day now. Here's Thomas Daglin to break down key evidence, some now made public for the very first time. By the time an avowed white nationalist with a cross spray painted on his t-shirt was being searched by London, Ontario police, he had attacked a Muslim family of five. Four were dead and the killer was in the mood to talk. Obviously, for what I did, obviously, I'm going to have any. More than two years later, a jury has been shown hours of video evidence. I want the world to know why I did what I did. Seen pictures from inside his apartment and heard weeks of testimony. The defense even called the attacker as a witness. Their shock as people wonder where exactly this is going. Now, will Nathaniel Veltman be convicted of terrorism-motivated murder? Here's what jurors saw and what they didn't see. The night before the attack, Veltman testified he hit the road to Toronto. His mind in a dreamlike state, still reeling from a magic mushroom trip. When he said he came upon a group of Muslims, he felt an urge to run them over but the jury didn't hear there's evidence Veltman had another target in mind as well. Prosecutors revealed directions to Toronto's Women's College Hospital were found on Veltman's smartphone. He had mused about attacking abortion providers, had a bag of weapons in his truck, and repeatedly viewed the writings of the man behind the deadly New Zealand mosque shootings. They can end up believing that anything can be a threat. Vanderbilt University professor Sophie Bjork-James has done extensive research on the white nationalist movement. When people enact this kind of terrorist violence, they want to become heroes and celebrated and remembered um, by others and inspire others. If someone were to cite this instance, this case, as inspiration to carry out violence in the future, how surprising would that be to you? Not at all surprising. In his London apartment, Veltman said he had been spending 12 hours a day or more consuming online conspiracy theories. On that sheet of paper, he had written down speeds and percentages, listing the likelihood of injury or death if a vehicle struck a pedestrian. Then on two separate occasions, in broad daylight on June 6, 2021, the court heard Veltman drove by groups of Muslims in London and again felt compelled to attack them. When he spotted the Ufzals, he said he could no longer resist the urge. Speeding towards a young boy, teenager Yumna, her mother Medea, grandmother Talat, and father Salman. I turned around, he recounted, stepped on the gas, and drove at them. The jury was shown pictures of the crash site with a road sign smashed to the ground. Members of the Muslim community sitting in the courtroom for the trial could at times be heard sobbing. What we, I think, in the community are really asking for is justice in the fullest sense. I think there is confidence. Uthman Quick speaks for the National Council of Canadian Muslims. They've kept in touch with family members of the victims. I don't want to speak on behalf of the family in any, any sense, but you can only imagine the difficulty of having to uh, listen to some of the, the details that have come out uh, during the trial. In the witness box, Veltman insisted he never had a plan to kill, and his goal wasn't to intimidate all Muslims. He was 20 years old at the time and testified he was depressed and paranoid, influenced by a strict fundamentalist Christian upbringing. A much different version of Veltman spoke openly to a police detective hours after the attack. It was terrorism. I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna like. I'm not gonna try to get a lighter sentence by saying 
It was just murder, not terrorism. And there's more. The jury wasn't shown the part of this interview where Veltman said he first considered a terrorist attack when he was 13. In this parking lot, less than five minutes after he ran over the Ufzal family, Veltman approached a taxi driver and ordered him to call 911. He put his hands on his head and got down on his knees. Veltman's future now is up to the jury. So, Thomas, I gather you have a bit more information that the jury did not have access to. Yeah, at least on two occasions last year, Adrian, according to a forensic psychiatrist's report, Veltman openly spoke about his plan to plead guilty. Dr. Julian Goger wrote that in August 2022, and again three months later, Veltman told him he intended to plead guilty. Something changed because this past September, Veltman in this courthouse pleaded not guilty to four counts of first degree murder and one count of mm. attempted murder. And here we are now with the jury deliberating. So can we talk possible outcomes for a moment? What do you see? Yeah, the defense insists that uh, the jury should consider lesser charges of second degree murder or even manslaughter. But the Crown says this was certainly first degree murder. And uh, in her instructions to the jury today, the judge laid out two pathways for Veltman to be convicted of first degree murder. The first pathway is through planning and deliberation. If he planned this ahead of time, then it's first degree murder. If not, uh, the judge said it could be terrorism, according to the Crown's case, which means that Veltman, according to the Crown, carried this out, motivated by white nationalist ideology, to send a message to all Muslims that they're not welcome here, Adrian. All right, Thomas Dagla in Windsor for us tonight. Thank you. The families of the hostages taken by Hamas remain hopeful they will see them alive. I start every day thinking that by the end of the day, we'll see them. They tell us how they're coping with the ongoing uncertainty. Next. It's an agonizing ordeal for the families of hostages held by Hamas. So you have only this now. Caught in a state of constant dread. I don't even want to start imagining the worst case scenario. But knowing they must cling to hope. We found the strength that we didn't know that we have. Ioana Romiliotis spoke with families in Canada and in Israel to learn about their daily ordeal and their fight to have their loved ones set free. Little was said, that was the point. This is a silent scream, organizers told us. Look at them and don't look away. Many gathered on this day, healthcare workers calling on the International Red Cross to help the hostages. Aaron Brodutch is here too, a voice for his brother's wife and children, who he says are pawns in a cruel and complicated war. This is a situation that is a violation of human rights. It is a violation of international law. It is something that needs to be decoupled from all the other things in this war. Our best hope is that they're safe underground and they haven't seen sunlight for the last month. And this is kind of the best case scenario. I don't even want to start imagining the worst case scenario um, because I have to stay strong and fight for them. <laughs> In the raging conflict and a staggering Palestinian death count, the Israeli hostages are another layer of tragedy. For their family members and the communities standing behind them, these are haunting calls for mercy and for humanity. So many faces, so many empty chairs. This Shabbat table in downtown Toronto was set up as a symbolic reminder that every hostage has a family desperate to get them back. Mayan Zin seems hollowed. She says she's barely slept or eaten in more than a month. Mayan, I know if um, you can try this in English, can you um, tell me what is going through your heart right now? I have a carousel in my heart. 
Um, one moment I uh, happy because I think uh, uh, good about my uh, girls, and one moment I uh, cry. Fifteen-year-old Daphna, who loves to sing, and her eight-year-old sister Ella were visiting her ex-husband when they were kidnapped. Zin wanted to share a window into her nightmare. She sent us this video, live streamed by Hamas soldiers. It shows the girls with their father before he, his partner, and her son were killed, and they were taken. The girls last seen, Zin says, in these photos posted by Hamas. Zin recently made a desperate appeal to Israel and its allies. Rescue my girls or take me to them and let me be a hostage with them too. In another post, she appeals in Arabic to release her girls and for any woman who might be with them to simply hug them until she can. I can't bear the situation, she says thinking that they are alone and nobody's able to take care of them or be with them. As we speak, Zin suddenly gets up and returns holding the pajamas her girls last wore. So I have only this now. Oh, my daughter. Yes. So I have a little bit smell and uh, something to hug. In the uncertainty, there is space for agonizing hope, too. Many of the hostages are elderly who rely on medication for chronic conditions. <laughs> Their families are now part of organized appeals and individual ones. This is Mayan Sigal Koren. She and her sister Geffen Sigal speak to everyone they can. I'm Joanna. Nice to meet you, Geffen. I'm sorry it's the, under these circumstances. Ayana, nice to meet you. Sigal's mother, Clara, and four other family members are also captive. These interviews aren't easy, she says, but she has to do them. What is it like for you to live with that uncertainty? It's impossible. It's really hard. I feel like I'm surviving. Sometimes when we are fighting for our loved ones, we found the strengths that we might don't, don't, didn't know that we have before. Clara Marmon, a former kindergarten teacher who loves to bake, whose partner, Louis Har, loves to dance. Glimmers of lives before, Sigal refuses to give up on them. She and other family even celebrated her mother's 64th birthday, despite and because she wasn't there. This uh, celebration, it's really hard to call it celebration for us because we only celebrate the lives that we think that everybody might have there, but we don't know if and how she is. And it was really, really hard for us. And But it's important, it's important uh, to do it. And we really want the world not to um, stay aside and to help us to release them. Holding on to the promise of light, it's a daily exercise. Brodech checks in often with his brother, who was helping others when his wife and children were kidnapped. <laughs> Brodech asks how he is. His brother's response says it all. They're still in Gaza. This is Agal, my sister-in-law. She's just uh, an incredible person. She's a flea, she's 10. She turned 10 on the day she was kidnapped. She's just a, an adorable, adorable child. She was here for a month in Toronto this summer. Hostage posters of his niece and nephews, boys who loved Minecraft and making messes, seem surreal. Brodach has taken them to nearly a dozen rallies already and keeps hoping he won't have to anymore. And you're, you're continuing these efforts with that vision in mind because you don't entertain, you won't entertain, or do you want to think about the alternatives? A hundred percent. I start every day thinking that by the end of the day we'll see them brought back. A hundred percent. And uh, when my kids ask me when are they going to come back, I say tomorrow. 
And they say, you say that every day. And I tell them, I am going to keep saying that every day until we get them back. You know, it has to be so hard for these families just to, just to keep it together. Uh, we've seen Hamas release a few, very few hostages. Any, any hint of more about to be released? There are news reports that Qatar is collaborating with the U.S. to strike a deal between Hamas and Israel that would see some 50 hostages released in exchange for a three-day ceasefire. Mm -hmm. And part of the agreement also spells out potentially increasing humanitarian aid into Gaza and releasing some Palestinian women and children who are currently in Israeli prisons. But it's, these are signals. We don't have anything concrete. But it does suggest that there is some movement. And that's a lot for families. Talking is something. But, but in the meantime, what are these families doing? They're keeping up what can only be described as relentless organized pressure. And they are constantly trying to put the narrative out there in the public that the hostages must be removed from the wider conflict, that these are innocent people who are pawns. At the same time, they're, they're doing that with the support of communities in Canada and across the world. And it is a full-time job that they are personally taking on. Aaron Bro, Dutch's par uh, family in Israel, is camping out every day in front of military government, in front of military and government buildings. And others are doing countless interviews or constantly posting on social media, all in an effort to keep the story alive, to mm -hmm. keep compassion alive, but more than anything, to keep the pressure on Israel and its allies to bring these people home. All right, Joanna, thank you. You're welcome. Here's another story where the stakes are life and death. With British Columbia losing its fight against fatal overdoses, Ian checked out a group that says it is saving lives with illegally obtained drugs. So for our heroin, we always use red bags, and the meth is in green bags, and the cocaine is in clear bags. It is an activist group pushing for change. And back in September, co-founder Jeremy Callicum invited us to watch him package their version of Safer Supply. This is North America's first cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine compassion club. Though not supervised by any medical staff, the drugs here were tested at a university, carefully packaged with detailed labels from the precise contents to a warning. This kind of program, if it were to expand, what would the result be? What, what would the net change be? Obviously, there'd be less deaths, um, there'd be less overdoses, there'd be less of attacks on our healthcare system, less of, of attacks on policing. So Ian also looks at a program offering prescription fentanyl to hard drug users, and he'll ask BC's Minister of Mental Health and Addictions why the province isn't moving more quickly on safer supply. That is coming your way Friday on The Breakdown. Next, a near disaster on the tarmac. There's like an old Asian lady sitting right next to me and she, I could see her just get off her seat. We were like, wait, what's happening? Are we going to die? The heart stopping landing and the passengers inside right. in our moment. An Ontario man captured this video of a plane teetering from one side to the other, avoiding tragedy as it landed at Toronto Pearson Airport on Monday. So passengers inside were jostled around, some being lifted right out of their seats. The breathtaking close call is our moment. Whoa. For the last several years, I've been going to the airport to take pictures, and I've never seen anything like it. It literally took my breath away because it was terrifying. Everything felt great until the last minute. The last bit, it just like, the entire plane just like tilted on the left, tilted on the right. When it landed, everything, everybody sort of like got jolted out their seats a bit. Well, there's like an old Asian lady sitting right next to me, and she, I could see her just get off her seat. We were like, wait, what's happening? Are we going to die? Whoa! I've never seen a plane rock so suddenly on landing. My heart sort of almost skipped a beat for a minute. It was extremely rough, but it went by so quickly. Once I saw the nose touch down, I uh, definitely breathed a sigh of relief. That was kind of too terrifying. But right after it was like nothing had happened, everybody in the plane decided together that, hey, let's just ignore it. Like, you know, nothing happened, let's just keep go home. It just showed um, some really, really good piloting skills to save the plane in that situation. Even with very skilled pilots and very great airplanes, a lot of times we're still at the mercy of the weather. You know, no one's hurt. We got, we, he landed the plane safely. Can't wait to do that again next month. <laughs> Pretend like nothing's happening. So apparently that was wind shear. Uh, this was a flight all the way from Tokyo and full credit to the flight attendants who remained incredibly calm. Important to everyone there. Good on you.
from all of us here at the National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app. Subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.